Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. As we get started, I would like to introduce Lulu, who will um, talk to us about our interpretations today for our program. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Lulu, and I am here with the with the Community Language Cooperative. And I am here because the organizers of this event have made a commitment to language justice. What that means is that we want to create a space where everyone can participate and engage in the language of their heart or the language that they feel most comfortable in. We will use simultaneous interpretation to create this space. And when I finish saying this in Spanish, we will turn on the interpretation and you will see a globe icon that says interpretation. If you do not see the globe icon because you are on a phone or in a tablet, you can click on the three dots of the part that says more, select language and choose either language or uh, either is English or Spanish. If you are not fully bilingual, we ask you to please select your preferred language. And if you're bilingual, feel free to listen to everyone in their language. When you select your language, you can check mute original audio so you don't hear both languages at the same time. These instructions will be given in the chat box also. Hola, mi nombre es Lulu. Estoy uh, con Community Language Cooperative y estamos aquí porque los organizadores de este evento se han comprometido con la justicia del lenguaje. Lo que esto significa es que queremos crear un espacio donde todos puedan participar e involucrarse en el idioma de su corazón o en el idioma en el que se sientan más cómodos. Usaremos la interpretación simultánea para crear este espacio. Cuando yo termine de decir esto, activaremos la interpretación y verá un icono de globo que dice interpretación. Si no lo ve el icono porque está conectándose desde su teléfono o tableta, haga clic en los tres puntos o en, la parte donde dice, o en la parte donde dice more y seleccione el lenguaje escogiendo el salón de inglés o español según sea su preferencia. Si usted no es completamente bilingüe, le pedimos que seleccione su idioma preferido. Si es bilingüe, puede escuchar a todos en su idioma. Una vez que haya hecho esta selección, puede hacer clic en silenciar el audio original para que no escuche ambos idiomas al mismo tiempo. Si tiene alguna pregunta, la pueden hacer en el salón del chat. If you have any questions, you can ask in the chat room. Please select your language now and I will check to make sure you can hear me give, giving me. Hello everybody and thank you for joining us on International Women's Day for ADL Southwest and the Houston Rockets third annual Women's Summit, Choose to Challenge. I am Southwest Regional Board Chair, Mark Trachtenberg. And I have been looking forward very much to today's program because I know it's going to be inclusive, informative, and inspirational. Before we begin, a little bit about the ADL and why we have a women's initiative. ADL was founded in 1913 to fight anti-Jewish hate, but our founders quickly determined that you can't fight one kind of hate and ignore others. We must all work together to counter exclusion, marginalization, disrespect, and discrimination, because when those things affect one of us, they affect all of us. ADL's Women's Initiative was founded by board chair Sherry Levy and other committed leaders who knew that while we have come a long way in obtaining equal rights for women, we still have a long way to go. One of our founding members and our own Women's Initiative chair, Yvonne Harris, will tell you more and introduce our moderator. Thank you, Mark, for starting us off today. And as Mark mentioned, my name is Yvonne Harris, and it is a joy to serve as the chair for ADL's Women's Initiative. Happy International Women's Day, everyone. This is the highlight of my day, and I thank you for joining our webinar and for the honor of your time. The mission of ADL's Women's Initiative is to unite diverse women and ADL's efforts to promote respect and challenge bigotry through dialogue and awareness. Like the program we're about to experience, Women's Initiative sponsors and supports several events annually featuring distinguished, engaging speakers on topics related to ADL's overall mission. To set the proper foundation, International Women's Day is a global celebration of the achievements of women. It also serves as a prompt to remember our collective responsibility to advocate for women's equality. Connected to this concept, I understand that the success of the women's initiatives and our programs, and this program in particular, which is now in its third year, 
is an extension of the work and the achievements of all past WE Chairs, WE members, and ADL leaders who have been a consistent support. This has truly been a team effort. This year's theme, Choose to Challenge, is one that we're all committed to through our panel of leaders and experts to learn how to face our challenges, learn from these experts as they've faced their challenges and are groundbreaking game changers and why they chose to meet those challenges head on and overcome them. As you hear the word challenge today, please remember that on the other side of every challenge is an opportunity. So lean into our panel and take away tangible actions that will set you up for your next great success. One of the experts who will lead us today is Julia Morales. You may know her from her coverage of the Houston Astros and the Houston Rockets on AT&T Sportsnet. If you don't know her, you will by the end of the program and you will want to tune in and watch her. Julia, on behalf of the ADL and the Women's Initiative, we are thrilled to have you as our moderator. We'd like for you to introduce our panelists and then start by telling us your story. Thanks, Julia. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, this is already a challenge for me to be uh, involved in something like this. I'm so thrilled to be a part of it. And I want to start by wishing everyone a happy International Women's Day. I don't know about you guys, but already jumping on social media this morning and, and just seeing all the love and the post and it, it truly is inspiring. And, and every day, I believe, should be International Women's Day. But on a day like this, where we all kind of come together and have these important conversations, is, is just, it, I'm just thrilled to, to be here and be a part of it and to be surrounded. When I say this was a challenge for me, to be surrounded by uh, the group that I'm surrounded with today and the, the, being able to ask them questions, it, it's, it's just inspiring. So let's, let's get on with it. Let's hear about our panelists. Uh, like I said, in a very impressive panel we have today. So I'm going to read off their bios because they're so impressive. I don't want to mess anything up. Uh, so I'll start with Cynthia Cooper Dyke, whom you probably know is one of the greatest basketball players in history, named most valuable player of the WNBA finals all four seasons. She was with the Comets, go Comets, and she still holds the record for the most finals MVPs. The fans even voted her as one of the top 15 players in WNBA history. And now using her knowledge and skills to coach and educate students of Su or Texas Southern University. Then we have Tamika Curry-Smith. I guess, I guess you guys could wave. I should have told you all that when I, there you go. <laughs> I know you can see there's Cynthia waving as well. Tamika Curry-Smith though, president of the TCS Group, a company that provides human resources and diversity, equity and inclusion solutions to clients in a variety of industries. She's headed up DEI teams for Nike, Mercedes-Benz, USA, Target, and Deloitte Consulting, among other companies. She's received the Chairman's Award from the National Black NBA Association and has been named one of the Diversity NBA's Top 100 Under 50 Executive Leaders. Impressive stuff there. We thank you for having, or thank you for joining us today. And then Alex Lewis, wait for us, Alex. There you go, with, the, with an awesome backdrop and everything, ready to go. A member of the inaugural class of female Eagle Scouts. She's are having obtained their Eagle Scout designation while attending high school and college simultaneously. Can't wait to dive into your busy, busy life here in a second. Alex currently attends Lone Star College Tomball where they will earn their associate degree with highest honors in May. Congratulations on that. And then they plan to attend a four year university and focus on a theater career. Somehow Alex finds time to volunteer with Planned Parenthood Holocaust Museum, Houston, and serve as stage manager of their college's theater company. So much there. And last, but certainly not least, because her amazing resume could take up all the time that we have today, Dr. <laughs> Laura Morillo, way for us there, has been president, there you go, and CEO of the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce since 2007. She has led the chamber to set unprecedented records in membership and revenue, making it one of the most influential chambers in the country and the recipient of the National and Regional Hispanic Chamber of the Year Award from the U.S. Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. She is the founding president and CEO of the Chamber's Foundation, founding executive producer for the Chamber's radio and TV programs, and her storied career has included a seven-year stint as an executive at Memorial Hermann Texas Medical Center and 15 years as an executive at her alma mater, 
the University of Houston. Dr. Murillo's awards are too numerous to mention, but most recently named Texas CEO Magazine's top 30 Texas CEOs during COVID-19 for the exceptional leadership she displayed in 2020. Told y'all, impressive panel we have today. And I know we're, we're all very excited to be here. Um, I, we're just, we're lucky to uh, hear each other's stories, but for everyone that's, that's here today to uh, get some knowledge and, and get some perspective from all of our panel, all of these leaders today. So I'm gonna quickly tell you a little bit about me. I have no idea how I even got into this, <laughs> this group here, um, I, but I am, like I said, thrilled to be here. I, I as Yvonne mentioned at the top, I'm on TV these days. I cover the Houston Rockets as well as the Houston Astros. And now that baseball season's about to get started, you'll see me a lot with the Astros. I cover all games for them through the playoffs, a, a fun gig that I've had since 2013. But, but to give you a little bit of background of how I even got there, I was 10 years old and I knew exactly what I wanted to do when I grew up. My dad was a government school teacher, pretty passionate about wanting to just change things for, for people like him, decided to run for US Senate here in Texas. Um, got the, the votes he needed to, to got the petition going, um, somehow put this crazy campaign campaign together. Um, and we were along for the ride. I was 10 years old, like I mentioned. So I got to see reporters come in and, um, and TV reporters doing their live shots. And I found that really fascinating. So knew exactly what I wanted to do. I studied journalism, uh, got into college. That's when I started to see females on TV covering sports. It was about that time when I was getting into college, something I had never known was an opportunity, never known was something I could get into. And so when that happened, first of all, my mind kind of, it was blown at the fact that I could, you know, study journalism, but also cover sports, which was a passion of mine. I played all sports, wasn't very good at any of them, but I loved them in, in any way. And so I put those things together. I've, I've been a weekend sports anchor. I was that right out of college, only woman in the sports office. Uh, covering sports and, and that market. And then when I made it to bigger cities, you started seeing more females in roles like I had, uh, but I landed the, the regional network job, which is the one I have now covering the Astros since 13, as I mentioned, they weren't very good back then, but they're much better. As you guys know, they're a much better team to cover and be around these days, world champs, um, but only female to travel with the club, playing buses, honestly, a little jarring at times, uh, you know, you just want someone to have a glass of wine with sometimes on an off night, but uh, not an option for me early on, but lots of, you know, just proving my professionalism, the consistency that I had brought me to be more comfortable. And then everyone was more comfortable with me. I've developed really great relationships with not just the team, the staff, but also the organization. So um, it's been an interesting journey. Uh, to say the least. And, and, you know, one of my favorite things to do now is, is turn around and, and give back and, and just bring that awareness that, you know, as a female, you can, can be in sports and you can be on TV and, and do some of these things that I didn't know was possible until it was almost too late. So, you know, I think, uh, you know, these leaders on the panel would agree with me that that's something they're trying to do as well as they're here today and nothing's without obstacles. You know, I mean, we, we've all had our share and I love that this panel all comes from different walks of life, backgrounds, generations, even uh, the careers and interests. So one thing though we did do everyone is we survived 2020 and, uh, and then currently navigating through a pandemic uh, as well, you know, we're still doing that. But Dr. Murillo, I'd like to start with you because this is something you have done such a great job at nav navigating through that pandemic. Uh, what challenges, obstacles did you face maybe because of gender that pr would prepare you for this would prepare you for the future. I think I want to first begin just by saying congratulations to everyone on the screen. I'm so inspired by your individual and collective efforts and to ADL for the opportunity to visit. I think all of us have gone through this time in a variety of different ways. We've been blessed, I think many of us to continue moving forward with our careers and most of all with our health and safety. Having said that, as I thought of my message to the folks on the uh, call today, mine is on confidence. And mm -hmm. even during the pandemic, it was that confidence and that self-esteem to know that we would make it through. When you look at the study that KPMG put together, it indicated that 67% of women, 67% of women believed that they needed support from their companies to help them with confidence. And very quickly, I know we've talked about basketball. It comes to mind as I think of my daughter when she was just a little girl, co-ed basketball. And the boys wouldn't throw the ball 
to the girls. There were only about a handful of girls. And eventually by the end of the season, there were only two girls on the entire co-ed team. My daughter Mia never got the ball, but my conversation to her was when you get the ball, you shoot the ball. The last five seconds of the basketball game, we're tied. I'm sitting under the rim. Mia is looking and asking for the ball. Her only other female teammate is saying, pass it to Mia, pass it to Mia. The little boys on the team are saying, no, no. I'm cheering Mia on. And it's as if time had stopped. Steven passed the ball to Mia. It was in slow motion. She got the ball. And I just remember saying, shoot the ball. And I remember the other little girls that were there Mia, shoot the ball. She scored the winning point. And not only that, they lifted her and cheered her on. Imagine what that did for a little girl and what it did to build her confidence. Mm -hmm. So much was at play by that little boy, Steven, passing the ball. And so today, as we go through COVID and we go through careers and life, I know there are men and women out there who have the ball and we're encouraging them to pass it. And when they do, let's be like my daughter Mia was. Let's be ready to shoot the ball. Thank you. That's excellent. Uh, all the way around, great story. Go Mia, <laughs> first of all. And while we're on the topic of basketball, you know, I'll, I'll toss this to Cynthia, who I'm a huge fan of, by the way, I'm not gonna, fan out on you too much but basketball was my first love but one of the best ball plays out ball players out there so there's no way you had obstacles right uh and I'm totally <laughs> kidding but you know as a sports fan who's seen what women's sports have, have had to go through and still go through can you tell us more about your experience well my journey has been you know riddled with obstacles and challenges but none of which I considered um quitting you know, I never considered quitting. And um, so first I'd like to, you know, thank the ADL for having us all, um, especially having me, this is an incredible panel. So um, I feel very privileged to be a part of the panel. Um, I, I will tell you that during my journey, I grew up in the inner city in Los Angeles and Watts and um, boys wouldn't let me play. They wouldn't even let me come to the gym and call a game and select my own team. I had to have my brother come mm -hmm. to the gym and, and, and call the game so he could choose me to then play um, on his team. Obviously, as I got older and I got better, then you know they 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 really allowed me to come in as as one of them, just as a ball player, not as a female basketball player. Um, so you know there are plenty of times playing with the guys I never received the ball. Um, there are plenty of times playing with guys that I was either wide open or the best option, but I never received the ball. But there was never a moment where I allowed other people's actions to determine my success. I've never allowed other people's decision to stir me or to deter me and, and get me off of my path. My goals have always been in the forefront. And no, while I wasn't always the most confident, I was always focused. I had a laser focus on the goals that I had set for myself and that I wanted for my family. And that was where my energy was placed. That's where my focus was. That's where my determination was placed. And I would just encourage everyone that because we all have different stories, mm -hmm. I would encourage everyone to look in the mirror and, and know that the person staring back at them is enough. You're strong enough. You're pretty enough. You're vibrant enough. You're, you're, you can achieve literally anything you want to if you're not afraid to fail, get back up and do it all over again and do it better the next time. Steph, uh, we'll keep going. And before I <laughs> go to our next panelist, I mean, I, it's this idea sometimes when women find themselves in roles that maybe they weren't traditionally a part of before, it's is that not only when we get those jobs or we get those opportunities or we're on those teams, it's like we have to be perfect, uh, but also how can we be perfect when, you know, some of us find us ourselves in situations where 
people think we're automatically less than or we're ne less knowledgeable because of gender. And, and that's something I've I've had to deal with. That's probably the biggest hurdle I had to clear was being in a man's world. Um, gosh, I wish we could get rid of that whole term. Uh, but you know, it, it's it, being there, being in a job where I'm I'm trying to talk about a sport like baseball, which you know women are are not playing baseball just yet at the major league level. Where you know I'm talking to my audience, mostly men, who a lot of them think that I just don't know what I'm talking about because I didn't play or just because I'm a female. So that's one of the biggest hurdles I've had to climb. It's taken a lot of work. I, you know, in the beginning, I did feel like I had to study harder and, and be this and, and work harder than men. Um, but I was always, always like, like Cynthia was saying, I mean, we laser focus. I was, you know, that's, that was my goal which is just put myself in, in the best position to succeed. And, uh, and I, I'd want to pass that on as well. That we do not need to relax, but, but however, we, we deserve to be there is my point and all of that um, and it and it takes work but but we get there and, and I just hope we can make it easier sure. for those who are next and the younger generation so this is where I want to bring Alex in um, Alex proving people wrong uh, just with about everything that you're doing uh, earning Eagle Scout rank and very quickly too um, that's not normal how, how quickly you were able to do that but girls young women just allowed in recently so what made you want to pursue that and did you feel any sort of pushback so women actually were only allowed into scouts as participants into the scouts BSA program as of February of 2019. Um, so I made it in just under two years. Uh, the average is around four to five years to, to achieve Eagle. Um, so you're right, I did it in a, about half the time that most people do. Um, I think my, my, my biggest motivation there was the fact that I saw my older brother um, or an Eagle before I did. And I'd been kind of unofficially in scouts for a really long time. I'd gone on campouts. I'd done, you know, nice safety. I'd done camping. I'd done a lot of things that scouts do. I just hadn't received any of the credit for it just because of a letter on my birth certificate, essentially. Um, so when I could, I, I mean, I just immediately jumped on it. I said, okay, this is something I can do now. I am doing it. I sat down with my mom and I planned out month by month what I needed to do in order to get it as soon as possible. Um, and a lot of the pushback was from just people thinking that I didn't have the experience and that I didn't have the skills needed to go forward at the pace I did. But I, I, just proved everyone wrong. It wasn't a matter of, you know, I had to do anything specific. It was just, I kept being a very proficient scout and doing what I knew I needed to do to get my Eagle. And I proved everyone wrong really quickly. I attended a national, the national youth leadership training and showed my leadership skills there, both as a, as a participant and as a staffer. I attended World Jamboree and I got to meet scouts from all over the world. Um, and it was just a constant thing of, I can do this just as well as any man who's been in the program has, even men who have been in for longer than I have. And, and just really quick, I wanted to say, okay. congratulations, Alex. Yeah. Heck yeah. yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's how you go get your dream, you know? <laughs> I, just, I just wanted to say really, really quick, and, and to your point, Julia, you know, I never allowed someone else to determine my path. I've never allowed what they thought about it how they felt about it or how they spoke about it to determine my decision-making. I've always stayed on my path, my journey and my goal structure. Yes. And I've used that to serve as a motivator is you can't work full time, work on your doctorate, have a toddler and be pregnant with a second child while my mother had a massive heart attack. None of that deterred me. It made me more focused. I surrounded myself with people who believed in me. And I want to congratulate all the women on the panel today and those who are watching to say, people, passion, and persistence. Find people who believe in you and you can do so many things with those positive thoughts, that confidence, and just so proud of you for earning that Eagle Scout. What a pioneer you are and a legacy that you will leave for other young women to do the same. Congratulations. I really do hope to be the first of uh, a generation and many generations of female Eagles. There are currently um, 20, there were 22 members from the Sam Houston Area Council. 
uh, there were hundreds across across the nation. Um, so I'm I'm just I'm one of the first, and I'm really pleased to see that my um, my my fellow scouts all over all over the country have had the same confidence that I have in pushing forward. Um, because I know that it hasn't been it hasn't been easy for any of us, especially getting it in such a short time. And honestly, I'm amazed that I was even chosen for this. You know, I looked at everyone else's resume and I was like, ah, I just joined an organization and, you know, I went camping. Um, but it, I guess what people have pointed out is I did do more than that. I, I, I'm doing all this while going to college as a Jewish scout. Um, so I think there, there is a lot to be said for, you know, not letting any, any boundary that anyone tries to say is, is some kind of limit actually letting it be it, it's not worth letting it be a limit to you just ignore it and keep pushing i love that alex is a part of this because this is all about changing ideas cultures in a way that's better for everyone um, and creating the conversation and i want to bring tamika in and i've got some follow-ups for all of you but tamika i want to bring you in because this is your specialty doing some incredible yes. work uh, what led you to what you're doing now what experiences made you so passionate about diversity and, and gender equality uh, etc yeah, thank you. First of all, I want to also um, say how grateful I am to be a part of this wonderful group and, and to be here for International Women's Day, which is so important. And I've been doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work for about 20 years now. Um, I say that it's not just my passion, but my purpose, and uh, can't imagine myself doing anything else. But I really kind of um, stumbled into this work. I'll give you a little bit of backstory. I was born and raised in the Detroit, Michigan area. And although Detroit is often thought of as a predominantly Black city, which it is, it's also a very diverse city in, in, in many other ways. And many people don't know this, but it has the largest Middle Eastern population outside of the Middle East, a large Jewish population, a large Polish population, a big uh, Asian and Indian population. And I grew up with all of that diversity around me, uh, friends from all walks of life, religions, ethnicities, backgrounds. I probably went to as many bar and bat mitzvahs uh, as I went to mosques with friends. And so uh, that was really the backdrop of my upbringing. Uh, and we were all friends, didn't see diversity as a bad thing, but a good thing that really enhanced our lives. And I will say that that probably has inspired me throughout my life and my career to try to recreate that in all of the spaces that I've been in. But unfortunately, in corporate America and many, many of those spaces, even, you know, going to college, um, being in the minority, being one of the few or one of the only um, has been more my reality. And so I've just been focused on how do I change that? How do I proactively give back? How do I help recruit and bring more people from different backgrounds into organizations? And then once they're there, help them thrive and, you know, continue to develop and get promoted and, and rise through the ranks. And so I think it continues to be a focus for corporate America. We've certainly come a long way, but we have a long way to go. And I think when we look at uh, the challenges that women face, we know that women of color, for example, face even more challenges. And if we look at those challenges that have already been present, COVID-19 has just exacerbated that. And unfortunately, many of the gains that women have made in society and in corporate America we have, you know, unfortunately seen those, those gains start to diminish. And so when I think of this focus on choose to challenge, it has never been more important than now when it's really incumbent on all of us to challenge these inequitable systems that we know exist and whatever sphere of influence we have and whatever environment we're in, we all need to stand up and choose to challenge every day. Amen. Up and get some, yeah, right. And to get some more insight on maybe what some of these companies are trying to do. Where, what is the next step? And you know, where is it going right now? Where do we all need to get better uh, first? You know, priority wise, what what are what are companies pushing for right now? And and what do you hope that we're all pushing for right now? Yeah, I mean, I think a really easy framework for us all to think about is workplace, workforce, 
marketplace, and community. And basically what that means, workforce is the people within an organization, workplace is the culture, uh, marketplace is all of the business related initiatives, and then community is what you're doing to uplift um, the, the communities that you live and work in. And so I would say we need to do it all. Uh, I, I don't think there's one that's more important than the other. They all are intertwined and interconnected. Uh, you can't do things internally without focusing externally and vice versa. You can't bring people into an organization and then have a climate that does not appreciate leverage and celebrate difference. So workforce and workplace are important. And you also can't exist as an organization without a focus on how to integrate DEI into everything that you do and the products and services and offerings and your customers and consumers, right? And so it really is thinking about this work in a holistic way and then putting the resources to it and having a plan that will bring to life over a number of years how to make a change in the space. It doesn't happen overnight. We didn't get here overnight and we won't get out of it overnight. So it really is about being intentional and putting a plan in place that's holistic and multifaceted. I'm gonna go backwards, back to Alex. Uh, you know, obviously your future is very bright. <laughs> <laughs> That's obvious. We can all see that. Um, where do you want to see change, though? And what do you want to see from your generations? You, you did mention being a member of the Jewish community and making that community very proud. I know that you we had talked offline about some of the changes that you were making there, changes for the better uh, when it comes to some of the challenges and you know scheduling conflicts, things like that, that open their eyes to. But then also uh, misconceptions with gender and, and obstacles there. I mean, Give us where you want, you know, where you want us to get better. One of the big things kind of relating to the, the Jewish identity that I have that I see is a lot of people in my generation just don't have the same Holocaust education. Um, I've actually, uh, we've seen, especially in high schools, like an uptick in, you know, Holocaust jokes and drawing swastikas and stuff like that, just because we don't have the same education. And I think part of preventing discrimination is focusing on on the horrors of history, whether that's the Holocaust, whether that's the generations of slaves that we had in the United States, um, Japanese internment camps, all of that that we're not educated about that allows us to continue prejudice. Uh, I think one of my big things is just education on, on uncomfortable topics. Uncomfortable topics still deserve discussion. Um, and I think they, they partially deserve discussion because they are uncomfortable that's something that I really want to see with my generation and honestly with older generations as well, being willing to have conversations that no, aren't necessarily easy. Um, I think my generation is getting better with acceptance in some areas. We, uh, we have uh, higher rates of uh, LGBTQ youth, um, partially just because we are, we're more accepting of those identities. We're giving words to uh, identities that have just not been given that same respect before. Uh, but I think we, we do, especially in terms of um, just casual discrimination, have a long way to go. We're, we're, very, we're very conscious of using slurs, but not as conscious of things like stereotypes. And for my generation, I really want to see more consciousness about that and about how we, about changing our unconscious biases. It's great to hear it from you um, and how you feel about those things. And you're a big part of that generation. So we're, we're looking to you uh, to help change it all for the better. Uh, as I swing this back around, Dr. Murillo, uh, a more high profile career for you. This is something I was, you know, as I did more research on all the things that you've accomplished, um, that high profileness is something that I, I found, you know, similar to what I do as someone that's on TV and all of a sudden people, you know, take, I have to be careful. You know, we have to be careful in everything that we say and the way we live our lives. It turns into your lifestyle. Um, I was lucky to have parents, mentors who prepared me for, for that part, uh, but it can be a struggle, you know, wanting to be a, a good example, but also needing to maybe bite your tongue when you don't want to be silenced and there's this balance. Um, did, did this come easy for you? You know, just being in your position and, and having all these eyes on you, it, what advice is my question? Would you give to someone that's younger to uh, that's headed for a job that could be similar to yours? Well, I attribute so much of this to my role models and my most important influencers. 
by parents who had second grade educations and came across the Rio Grande with no English, no money, just a hope, a dream and a prayer for their nine children. I'm the youngest of nine. And every day I work toward making sure that the work that my parents did, the sacrifices that they made are not in vain. And it has allowed me to do things and challenge myself because when I look at it, I see opportunity. As mentioned, I surround myself with the right people and I'm doing it because I know that I can help others open doors. And so I do not take it for granted. I see it as an honor and a privilege. I find ways to have balance in my life. And I encourage others to take those challenges, to accept those big dreams and not be afraid of them. And if you're hearing voices that are telling you you can't do something, you're listening to the wrong people. You'll be inspired by other folks if you make it a conscious effort to do it. I told you about Mia. She now is 18, is a first year student at Georgetown University with an A average. My eldest, Marisa, she pursued mechanical engineering. And I still remember those little boys in middle school and high school who wouldn't give her a chance to do the kind of work that she wanted to do. They wanted her to design the t-shirts. She wanted to design the car. And I remember specifically, they were building a car for a big national competition and the boys couldn't saw through to build a car. And she said, let me try. And they said, you can't do it, you're not strong enough. But what they didn't know that she'd been self-taught to knit and she had very strong hands. And one boy said, go ahead, try. And she did it. And she ended up cutting the entire frame for that car. And next month, God willing, she's graduating from Columbia University and Ivy League School with a degree in mechanical engineering. Congratulations. That's awesome. Congrats. That is awesome. You know, today is International Women's Day. So it's a celebration, uh, you know, this is like I mentioned earlier on social media, just around, even on TV, you're seeing that the segments and this is, this brings up a, another question. Is this important? Uh, should we be celebrating, you know, why, why is it important? So Cynthia, someone who teaches coaches now, um, someone that was in a, you know, in a profession where you were handed trophies and, and had banners and, um, you know, why is it important to celebrate days like today, especially for women? Well, there's a, a certain level of acknowledgement that goes with, you know, a day like this and it acknowledges and, and it also teaches and uh, inspires people who like, I didn't know Alex was an Eagle Scout. I didn't know what it took to become an Eagle Scout. I, you know, there are certain things that I would have never known had it not been celebrated on days like this, you know, and I also look for opportunities to celebrate us to celebrate women, to celebrate each other, to lift us up and motivate us to do better, to want better, to inspire, aspire to be better. You know, for me, I, I didn't have a lot of role models growing up and people telling me what I could do. I had more examples of what I should not do, of the path I should not go down. And that served as inspiration also. So you find ways to inspire yourself and to stay on the path that's destined for you. You know, I tell my players all, all the time, step into your spotlight. I can't step into your spotlight. You need to have the confidence and the fearlessness to step in your spotlight. And that's what, it, that's what a day like this does for women. It allows us to step into our spotlight. Yeah, and I, I mean, point. I would add that, you know, representation matters. So we know, like you said, if, if we're trying to inspire this new generation, if you see it, then you believe it, and then you can achieve it. So it's important for us to recognize, celebrate, and uplift women who have accomplished so much from the beginning of time, but don't always get talked about. So having a particular focus to highlight those efforts and to highlight the accomplishments is important to show uh, young girls and young boys, quite frankly, 
what is possible. And, you know, there's this African proverb of, you know, if you educate a man, you educate an individual. If you educate a woman, you educate a nation. And to me, that means that um, there's no society anywhere around the world, and this is International Women's Day, so we're talking about the whole globe, that can truly reach its full potential without women being able to contribute in a meaningful way. And so to me, that's why it's important to acknowledge and to celebrate this day and, and continue to uplift women and everything they do every day sometimes without any recognition. Yes, and it's important. One of the things that you mentioned, and that's why I told the specific stories, is that it should not be an us versus them. It should be, in fact, a, a conversation that inv involves all of us to respect those differences and those opportunities. Sometimes all we need as women is someone to give us that opportunity and to treat us with respect and dignity. And unfortunately, we still live in a society, even in this country today, where that respect and dignity is not afforded to us. And I think we all, especially if you are raising children or you interact with younger people or children is to help them at a very young age, appreciate and acknowledge that. And also I think, especially as we look at confidence of women and I'll mention it again, that is one of the key factors that determines their success rate, whether it's to take a chance at a new career, go back to school, you name it, it goes back to confidence. And one of the things that I said to my daughters every day was the following, you are smart, you're beautiful, and God loves you. Because we need to believe in ourselves, despite what others say about us, to us, or that we can't do. It all comes from within. And so let's every day find ways to fortify the soul of other women, and especially little girls. And I would just really quickly add, you know, education, you know, Alex talked about education and knowledge. You know, we should be celebrating each other as, as I see you walk down the street. We should be celebrating each other all the time and, and sharing these stories and lifting each other up and motivating. And I, I want to be celebrated as a wife. I want to celebrate you as my daughter. I want to celebrate, you know, the moms and the, and I just think the entrepreneurs, I, we should be lifting each other up every single day. And hopefully this sheds a light on that, on that fact so that we could do it more often. It, it, it doesn't have to just be one day. It can be year round. And on that note, you know, women own more than 12 million businesses across the country. Think about that. And I know you're out there listening. There's someone out there thinking, I want to start a business. I want to go back to school. I want to get this designation. And you're overwhelmed. And you're probably listening to us thinking, well, it must have been this or the other. And I will say this, I guarantee you, it all started with that first step. Take that first step, mark it out. Look at what Alex did. She didn't go from, I want to become an Eagle Scout to getting it. There was, it was a process. It was one step at a time. I carried around my application for the doctoral program in my tote bag for six months before I had the courage to take that first step. And so again, write it down, take that first step. Don't let it overwhelm you. That's a great point. I don't think we're ever too old to be inspired, you know, either and, and by each other. And so I get excited when I hear about what, what women are up to and what the younger generation is up to, but also what my colleagues are up to and, and people that are around me. And just saw there was a, a young woman who was, a you know, the kicker for the Vanderbilt football team. And so that was a, a big moment for me. And not that, you know, I, I know what I want to do with my life, but watching, <laughs> watching her take the field, I'm holding my newborn and I'm like, wow, what can I do next? Like, you know, what, what's next for me? I mean, this is just, it was exciting. And you, you get that rush. And, and I think that we all need to continue to push each other and, and make ourselves better. Uh, we are seeing some women join coaching staffs in baseball, not, it's not softball, baseball, major league baseball. Um, they're making, they're, they're making sure that dressing rooms are made for females only and some of the new ballparks that are coming up, they're changed, they're gutting out some, some minor league ballparks and making sure it's done. That was inspiring to see. Um, but, but a couple of years ago, last year I didn't get the chance, but two years ago, I got to call a couple of innings of play-by-play -play for a major league spring training 
game. And that was a huge deal for me because it was just new. It was something, it was, you know, the next step for me. Um, and I don't want to speak for everyone else, but I hope that one day it's not a big deal only because I'm a woman. Cause that's kind of how it felt after the fact I got a lot of, wow, you're a woman in the booth. Wow. You know? And I was like, no, wow. I just called play by play for a major league baseball game. Like that's really cool. And, and I haven't done that yet. And I didn't mess the whole thing up. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's, that's the goal, right? Um, I, I think we're not there yet in a lot of professions and organizations, but, um, but yeah, I, you know, bottom line, I think we do continue to recognize and praise each other. At, in, even if it, it's new or if it's not new, like Cynthia was saying, it's just, it's good to, to push each other. So um, praising each other, lifting each other up. I hope we all continue to do that, not just in times of need either, just, just the because, right? Just because yeah. is, is very important. Well, um, just to add to that stat, as you talked about that, number one, congratulations for that. It may be the first of many. And as you said, that it opens doors for others. That in the area of equity and pay for women, we are still earning 75 cents to the dollar in, in minority communities, 45 cents to the dollar. That is unacceptable. And on top of that, we are raising children and are usually the prime, primary caretaker amongst our families. And so as women, it is extraordinarily important to uplift and support women as much as we can, given the many responsibilities that we hold. And it is also important for you to know your worth and to claim it and not be ashamed to ask for it, ask for that promotion, ask for that opportunity. It's there. You, you need to find ways to make those things happen. The things that make you happy for your impact and influence is very evident. And so don't be afraid. Take those big leaps. Dr. Mario, coming in with some excellent uh, words of wisdom and some advice. And I loved what you were talking about earlier on just uh, all the response, all the responsibilities that we have. And um, I just added one to my plate. I had a baby five months ago. So I was like doing a really good job. I was juggling all these. Congrats. Thank you. But I was like <laughs> juggling everything, doing a good, it, it felt like someone just kind of threw a basketball in the mix. And now I'm like, what, how, <laughs> yes, what? Exactly. how do I do this? I mean, yeah, y'all know. And so, oh, but yeah. we, but I'm, I'm still talking, but there is a lot to figure out. And I'm so glad that I have so many strong women around me who have been through this and done it. And that I'm, um, I'm looking forward to reaching out to and, and seeing how the heck I do this <laughs> um, because uh, it's, it's been a challenge for sure. And it's definitely given me a whole new level of respect too, for so many women out there who have accomplished some incredible things uh, while being a mom um, and so many other things to their families. So um, with that, I know Yvonne has joined us too. I know there was some Q&A and I, I said I was going to do a good job of keeping up with some of the stuff that was going on in the chat, but I didn't. I totally lied. So Yvonne, that's why you're here. Help me out. Um, let's see if anyone has some, some questions for the panel. Sure. We have some questions in the panel, but first I just want to say I am absolutely on fire listening to you ladies. Um, just such an inspiration. Laura, I love your, um, your advice to go for the big dreams. That's what this is about. Um, don't think small, go big. Um, your strength, your wisdom, your grit, your grace, it's all remarkable. So thank you. And it's like, I just want to pull from each of you and leave this webinar and Cynthia head over to your gym and try out for your basketball team. <laughs> and then Julia, when I'm not sport. playing, I want to do sports reporting. Tamika and Laura, d and I consulting in business. And then Alex, I want to tell every young person about opportunities to join the Eagle Scouts. But I know that's not what this is all about. It's really just about being the best version of yourself, learning from your lessons and applying it to your space and to your journey. So again, thank you. And um, Cynthia, let's go to you. There was a question that came through um, from one of our um, participants today. And it says, as a female, when you played in the WNBA, did you feel slighted knowing that you were not being paid like the men in the NBA? And I know we've talked about pay in this call, but just wanted to get your opinions on that question. Well, to be honest with you, no, because the WNBA was in year one. So if you think about the, the NBA in year one, those players weren't getting paid as much as the players are today. So there's some sacrifice that pioneers in any area have to make in order for the success of their league. And for me, the most important thing 
was that the WNBA was successful. I didn't want women ha that ha having to go overseas to pursue their dream of playing professional basketball. I wanted to lay the foundation and help to lay the foundation for women to be able to play and, and pursue their dream of playing professional basketball in America. That was my duty. That was my job. And I took that serious. I took that seriously every single game, every practice. Anybody who's ever played against me or practiced against me know that to be a true statement. I never took it for granted. I understood the importance of the moment. And I, and I made sure for all that I could do that my team was successful and that we laid a solid foundation for the WNBA players to come. Um, so for me, no, I'm more concerned about, as we talked about statistics earlier um, with Tamika and, and, Laura, and Laura, you know, about as, as a division one head women's basketball coach, the pay difference in a division one men's basketball coach. I think, you know, yes, their basketball is a little bigger, but I don't know if their game is bigger. I happen to be a hall of famer too. So let's throw that in there. Um, so yeah, I think I've done, I, I've paid my dues. And so the discrepancy between a division one women's um, basketball coach and a division one men's basketball coach, I'm more concerned with that as opposed to the discrepancy. And, and really this year, we just signed a new collective bargaining agreement. So the women are getting paid even more this year and they have more benefits. So they're continuing to grow. And I, and I foresee um, here in the years to come, uh, the, the, I believe they're gonna get their due just like women's tennis did. The game continues to evolve and Cynthia, we just thank you for your leadership on and off the court. You are a difference maker as all of you are. So thank you. Yvonne, um, I love your voice. You have such a comforting voice. You like Cynthia. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that. <laughs> there was a comment that came through to um, in the chat and Tamika and Laura, I'd kind of like to pitch this to you. Um, someone who's participating said that you know, they've received kind of the idea or the concept that why are women asking for these opportunities? Don't we have enough already? And men aren't asking for these same things. How do you respond to something like that? Well, you know, I, I here, here's my response is there definitely is, I think we all know, um, and it starts young, kind of a double standard around expectations for boys and girls. And I think what happens is that those expectations, almost gender roles um, continue through adulthood and they shape the reality is both men and women, all of us are products of, of our environment and our influences in our lives. And a lot of that shapes what we think is possible, what we think is normal, what we think we should be doing. And I'm one of those people that I believe that everyone needs to chart their own course. Um, there may be some women that say, I want to do X, and they're very happy just doing X. If there's another woman that wants to do X, Y, and Z, she should be able to do X, Y, and Z if that's the, the course that she's charting for herself. So to me, it's important that we get rid of the stereotypes and the limitations that we put both on, on boys and girls, on men and women, about what is acceptable and what is allowed. Because at, by the same token, men are the victims, in my mind, of gender stereotypes as well, in terms of how they show up and how they act and what they should do. Things like, for example, uh, you know, men the studies show that the, the vast majority of men don't take paternity leave, even though they have the time and it's offered by their employers. Why is that? Because there's this, this perception that, oh, it's the women, woman's job to take maternity leave and the man needs to keep working, et cetera. And so to me, I would just push back and say, it's not about an either or, it's not about what should be, it's what each person determines is their path and we should clear the road for whatever path that is so that people can reach their true potential. Yes, absolutely. And we know the data still indicates that if you look at elementary age children, that little girls are called upon less frequently than boys are 
and that often continues through their career trajectory, professional settings, et cetera. And so for the individual, if you're not experiencing any of this subtle or very overt discrimination, et cetera, wonderful. But there's still a large proportion of the population, specifically women and women of color, who every day face this. And it is incumbent upon each and every one of us to, as was mentioned, open that pathway for people to be able to pursue whatever it is that they want to pursue in their very own way. And not because they are a woman or because they're a minority, but because they are qualified and they have that opportunity to open those doors. Being an Eagle Scout is the highest honor one can attain. And as a mom who was a troop leader for Girl Scouts, my little girls always said, but why can't we be Eagle Scouts? because that is what is revered and held in very high esteem. But guess what? Just years later, Alex is sitting here because little girls like mine and so many other across the country asked that question and leadership made the decision that it didn't matter if you were male or female, that you should be able to have the opportunity to become an Eagle Scout. Well said, Laura and Tamika as well. Um, The next question from the panelist is um, a universal experience or from the audience, universal experience. As you're charting your course, as you're moving forward, as you're generating positive energy, how do you remove the negative people from your life? Alex, let's start with you and I'm sure we could get some quick advice from all of you. Um, I think part of Part of my experience is that there will always be negative people. You can't always avoid them. Um, One of the best phrases I have learned to just keep in my vocabulary is I'm talking, be quiet. Um, Because I've had to use that. I've had, you know, men speak over me when I'm the senior scout or when I'm the person who knows more and just being able to say, I'm talking and you don't get to talk over me. Um, is really, really important. So that's kind of, that's my biggest thing. And also understanding that there will, that people who have that kind of negative energy are understanding that even if it doesn't seem like they're working against you, they are working against you and you need to do what is best for you and your career and what you want to do. And that sometimes means cutting people out that other uh, you might people might not understand your decision or may disagree with you and you need to do what is best for your career and for your health thank you I we figured that out at your age because it took me a lot longer to get there so you're yeah <laughs> i i will say a bit the block button is um is an excellent yeah. tool that i you know i you know wonderful <laughs> the mute button no um so I get I get ugly tweets and I or you know social it's a big part of my job is why I keep bringing up social media it's a huge part of my job I have to be out there I have to be interactive Uh, I have to you know interact with fans and and talk to people and and that opens up the doors for anyone that's out on the interweb Um, and so I the negativity I get is is almost just it really has nothing to do with what I've, you know, the question that I've asked the player or what I said on the broadcast, it usually comes down to me just being a female in my role, being on TV, talking about baseball. And so they'll attack my, my appearance. They'll attack. So they'll say anything. Um, The shirt that I wore, uh, you name it. So, and, and one thing that I, that I heard a lot was where's your thick skin, where's your thick skin, but not all of us are born with it. And not all of us are born with the ability to, developed thick skin um so for me it was a lot of just I had to look at you know look within I had to to teach myself um how to handle certain situations and and how deep to to think about you know some of the some of the the comments and things that would come through like how far am I going to go with that or you know so eventually I just it was really it was like a lesson uh, something I'm still struggling with to be completely honest and I don't know if I'll ever get to a point where I'm okay with negativity um it's it's i get my feelings hurt very easily so yeah it's a it's a daily struggle for me but it is some a fight that i had to have internally and know that you know that 
they don't know me. Um, you know, people, when you, when you get personal, that's a, that's a whole different ball game. Um, you know, when you talk about negativity, but as far as people that don't know how hard I've worked to be here, or don't even really, you know, aren't attacking me for the right reasons. I've, I've really gotten better at being able to compartmentalize and, you know, what do I take to heart and what do I just mute or block um, and stay away from because it does absolutely nothing for me. You know, it, it's not going to, not going to help me in any in any way so the fast the faster that you can you know for those listening the faster that you can come to terms with that or take alex's advice the better off you'll be thank you for your candor julia anyone else like to add well i'll, I'll just add that um you know i'm very careful i'm very careful with what and who i allow in my spirit and in my space i'm very careful and you know block and deleting. I'm so quick to do that. So quick because I don't believe, you know, a, a kid asked me one time, Hey, well, what happens when you get teased when all of your friends are at the mall and you're in and on the basketball court practicing and you were your team practicing and you're never, never able to be, you know, have, hang out with your friends. I said, listen to me, all my friends were in the gym. And if you weren't in the gym, you weren't my friend. It's pretty simple. That was, that was my goal. And, you know, as far as social media, people use that platform. Some people, some people use that platform because they, they, they feel free to just say whatever and, and with no regard of how you feel about it or how it hurts you or affects you. So, you know, I'm really, really quick to, I only worry about things that I can't control and things I don't control, I don't worry about. But I'm also very, very careful who I allow in my space and in my spirit. Very important. Yeah, I would agree. You have to protect your peace and you decide who's in your circle. And so I think, um, you know, one of the ways is to counteract that, making sure you have positive people that are around you that are like-minded, uh, that will uplift and elevate you and also set boundaries. You may not necessarily want to completely cut off people um, that don't support you, but thinking through, you know, how maybe you don't talk about your professional goals with them, but maybe you hang out and do something more informal. But I think it's up to you to set those boundaries and they'll be different for different people. Some people may say, I don't want anyone around me that doesn't support me. And then others uh, will pick and choose what works for them. But remember that you are in control. I think that's the easiest way. Uh, and it's important to protect your peace. Laura, let me come to you. Um, our society still upholds um, certain roles for particular genders. So this particular role is typically held by women. What advice do you give um, those who are participating today that want to be a groundbreaker in a non-traditional role? How do they move forward with that? Well, certainly it is by looking at individuals who have done that. What are those characteristics? What have been the things that have been able to make them successful? What are you good at? Why do you want to do this? And then once you assess all of that is to work toward it. And the biggest thing I have found is that I was never the smartest, but one of the things that I was was very persistent. I was very passionate and I always surrounded myself with people who I believe were smarter than I was. And it gave me the tools to move forward, whether it was leaving the Texas Medical Center as one of the highest ranking reporting to the CEO on the executive committee, leaving that career to go to a nonprofit, which was the Houston Hispanic Chamber of Commerce almost 15 years ago, a nonprofit that was going through organizational challenges that needed a new office space two months after I arrived. It was because I believed and I saw the vision for the chamber, not of what it was, but of what it could be. And I knew there were enough people on that board and in the community that could rally behind this vision and lead them to that next space. But it was daunting. It was a big risk professionally and personally, but I have no regrets because I can now stand and look at what we collectively have done to set this Chamber of Commerce on a trajectory that was not what it was, but again, 
the vision of what we believe that it could be. And we are honored to have been recognized by the Houston Business Journal just a few days ago uh, with two diversity awards because there was a time when this chamber was 100% Hispanic in terms of our board of directors. And I said to the board at the time, we must change, we must be inclusive. If we're asking others to do it, it starts with us. And so our board has been up to 40% non-Hispanic. The emerging leaders that I asked the board for us to launch and put together for young professionals has not been only Hispanic or Business Institute has been very diverse. But rest assured, I was criticized for those changes, but that's okay. As a friend of mine, Jamie Roots indicated at one of the opportunities I had to hear him speak, if you're not being criticized, you're probably not relevant. Well said, Laura. Um, let's pivot just a little bit, slightly different topic for the men participating today and for the men in our lives. How do we coach them to be better allies, to show up differently in their support of women? And coach, why don't we start with you? Um, what advice do you give to the men in your sphere of influence on how they can just be more present and more impactful in their support of women? You sure you want to start with me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, I love men. And I love their strength. And I just would love for men to see us as more teammates, as opposed to the traditional roles that we might have had 50 years ago, or that, that might have been taught to us um, during our upbringing. You know, I believe that the way this society is today, that we need, we, we need each other. We need our family, we need each other to be strong so that our kids can see our bond and they can have a solid foundation in their growth as, as a youth. Now I have boy girl twins, they're 18 years old. My daughter plays basketball at Furman. She's also a mechanical engineer. She's studying in mechanical engineering. And my son is a business major at Pepperdine. Um, they're great, great kids. I think the biggest thing for, for me is I've always wanted a partner. I've always wanted a teammate. And I would just encourage men to, you know, not make this a competition. It is not a competition because we both want us to win. Completely. Yeah, completely agree. I, I think I'm a big framework person. Um, and Jennifer Brown from Jennifer Brown Consulting. She's a, a well-known uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion expert. She has a framework that talks about going from unaware to aware to active and to advocate. And I would just welcome, you know, men and anyone, even women. I think we sometimes need to take that journey as well to understand a lot of the issues. Um, and so really taking the time to educate yourself on the data on the statistics, on the stories, uh, coming to things like this is a great way to truly understand both the trials, the tribulations and celebrations that, that women endure. Um, and then once you are aware of the challenges and the work that needs to be done, how can you actively become a part of the solution? When you're in a room, when you're in whatever environment you're in, how do you speak up and advocate for women. Um, think about if you do have daughters, if you have nieces, do you want them to deal with these same things that women nowadays are dealing with in 20 years where there's still this huge wage gap when women are dropping out of the workforce um, you know, in huge numbers right now because they can't uh, stand to, to bear all of the challenges that they're facing right now and don't have the support they need. So whether that's at home with the people in your life or whether it's in whatever professional environment you're in, think about one or two actions that are tangible that you can take to speak up, to advocate for, and to change the situation for women because it we can't do it without men. It is it's impossible for women to try to drive the change on their own. 
Um, and, and we really need, as Cynthia said, women and men to look at this as a partnership and how do we enable society to be better because we're both pushing for what we know at the end of the day is right. I add to this too. I obviously agree with everything that you guys have said so far. Um, the, something that's just been heavy on my heart here recently working around major league baseball, there's been a lot of allegations that have come out, um, you know, for inappropriate behavior. And there's, again, there's just not a lot of women in that industry and we find ourselves very alone. And, you know, what happens if you do find yourself in a situation, all that started to come up. And, um, you know, I think, I think about all, or what I want, you know, I think about, well, okay, how do we fix this? What do we want? And I really just want in, in my situation, in my industry, I want men to stand up when they see something that's not right. And I want them to stick up for me. Um, you know, they, they say they respect me. Well, there's, there's nothing more you can do than by that, by helping me out in a, in a time where I need it. Um, because sometimes it's, it's hard when you feel like you're, it can be really lonely if you find yourself one of very few or one of the only women in a room full of men, or in my, my case, a plane full or, you know, a bus full. Um, and so I've just, that's been a, a huge topic in the world of sports. I know MLB just created a hotline, a, you know, confidential hotline that, that we could call, that players could call if they were to see something or coaches, you know, et cetera, people could call in if they saw anything. And I think that's great. We're going in the right direction. But, um, you know, when I had that conversation with myself, how do we, what, what do I want out of this or what, where do I want it to get better? I just want, I want them to say something. I want them to, to be able to stick up for us because it goes back to what you guys were saying and we can't do it without them. And we do need their help. I've had a lot of great men that have helped me along the way. I've asked a lot of dumb questions. I'm just going to be completely honest with y'all. I mean, I, you know, there were things that I didn't know along the way when I was younger and I, there's still things I don't know. And I, I trust men to, to take me seriously when I have a question and help me out. And, and, lots of them did that. They gave me these jobs. They put me in these positions. Um, so I'm so thankful for all of them out there, but um, there also are some, some problems that need to be fixed still um, in some of these environments that we've, we've gotten ourselves into. And so I hope they will be fixed. I hope they just continue to get better, but yeah, that's a, that's an even bigger topic, but it is something that's, that's weighing on me these days. Mm -hmm. And, and I, there is one player who stood up for me in a, in a really awkward situation that I was was in in a clubhouse. And, and to this day, he will remain one of my favorite players of all time because of it. It's just, it's not the norm. And I'm, I'm hoping we get to a point where that is the norm. Yeah, it's about holding people accountable. And as someone who is in meetings where 95% of my meetings are with males because of the conversations. And once again, because of the, the roles that they have in terms of decision making and the horrible things that I personally have experienced in terms of sexual harassment and opportunities for others to step up when they have not is to make sure that we do it ourselves and for others. And we are seeing, I do believe now, a more conscious effort to hold people accountable for those actions so that perhaps they think twice before they make some of those comments. But I recall in a very young, at a very young age, 19, being sexually harassed in a room with my boss and about 10 other men, and they all laughed. And I went to my boss immediately after to say, this person is harassing me, this is what I'm experiencing. And he said, oh, Laura, you know, he's just joking. And by the way, we can't say anything because this particular program that this gentleman was involved with would gain um, some bad commentary, et cetera. My point is for you and understanding the role that you play is that we must hold people accountable and that it still happens today. And let us not forget that. Thank you, Laura. It still happens. It's not the exception. Um, and we've got to make it not okay. Um, we have to shift what is the norm in our society. Alex, I'd love to hear from you as well. I've had um, at least two teachers that I can think of in high school. I have just, I had one who, uh, my PE teacher, who would just call me sweetheart. And like, I had to go to the nurse at one point and he, you know, made comments about it being, you know, lady problems, like casual stuff like that. It's just mm -hmm. like, why do you think that's okay? 
that wasn't even okay years ago when it was more normal. Um, I had a teacher who would constantly make jokes about the girls who were in cheerleading uniforms and he was 60 and had grandchildren who were our age. And none of the men in the class ever said anything. And I tried to report him and nothing came of it. They basically said, well, he's a teacher here. You know, he's filling a gap in the classes that we didn't have, so we can't get rid of him. And you're just gonna have to deal with it. And I had a list, a literal physical list of stuff that he had said, weird stuff that he had said and done to me and my female classmates. And the, the assistant principals who were mostly male basically excused it and that made some really uncomfortable situations and I think that if any of the men in that class had stepped up and either talked to that teacher or the principal things would have been different uh, and they would have taken it more seriously so I think one of the most important things that men can do is amplify our voices and say yes I saw that yes that did happen and just I believe you because when, when we have men that say that, it makes, it gives us the power to continue speaking up when something happens. Thank you for sharing that, Alex. And I truly believe that um, thanks to the efforts of each of you, things are already different. Um, so I know we're going to wrap up in a moment. And um, I want to just go back to comments made um, in the discussion, Laura, you made the comment, take the first step. And then the word step was also, Cynthia, used by you. And you said, step into your spotlight. And um, for many who are on this call, um, I was watching the NBA All-Star Game last night as I was prepping for this event and completely warmed my heart to see Cynthia being honored um, during the All-Star Game. And that wasn't just her win, that was <laughs> all of our when, and that ties back to International Women's Day and celebrating our achievements. So I know you're very humble, Cynthia, you didn't even mention it, but what a great learning for all the young people just to see all that you've contributed, not to women's sports, but to sports. And what was shared last night, so many of us have felt in our heart for you for so many years. So Thank please you. take your own advice and step into your spot like from last night. Hey, well, you know, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was, um, I, I actually missed it, um, but someone, re I, I saw a replay of it um, because I was, I was doing some other work. You know, the, the thing for me is it's never about me. It never has been. You know, I love basketball. I would have played in the WNBA for free. I, I love women being successful and stepping into their spotlight so that they can encourage the next generation, the next person to, to do the same. Um, so, so for me, it's about being solution-based. Um, so I never truly saw an obstacle. I only saw solutions to overcome that obstacle. Um, so I, that's where my energy has always been placed. And so um, it was it was fantastic to know that I was honored. Um, I, I don't take those opportunities for granted. Um, I'll just say that I want we all should be honored. I mean, Alex, what you what you're doing and Tamika and um, Laura and Yvonne have already said it and Julia. I mean, what you are doing and what you're enduring on a daily basis that none of us know about is amazing. And so I want you to, to continue to stay encouraged that you're on the right track and that you're doing a fantastic job. So this, I, I appreciate the love, but it's really about all of us. It is about all of us. And thank you, um, Cynthia, for those, um, those great uh, comments. And um, we are close to time. So um, grateful and appreciative for all that you've given today, all that you've shared, and looking forward to opportunities to continue this conversation in whatever format it looks like. And guess what, we don't have to wait till March 8th, 2022 to come back again and to continue to support each other 
and to continue um, to celebrate each other's achievements and successes. So many thanks to our supporting partners today, um, the Houston Rockets, the Houston Dynamo and Dash, at and Sports Nets, the TCS group, Texas Southern University, where Cynthia coaches, uh, the Women's Resource Group, Women in Sports and Events, um, the Menninger Clinic, Veritex Community Bank, Congregation Beth Israel, um, the Epic Collaborative Advisors, the HCRJ, which is the Houston Congregation for Reform Judaism, Lone Star College, and the Mexican Consulate of Houston. And even just reading that list, what great support and great engagement from our community. So um, thanks everyone again for your time. Thank you for all the advice that you've shared. And most importantly, thank you for the ADL for powering this program and making it happen. Um, again, happy International Women's Day to all and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good job. Great job, great panel.